Hello and welcome to the Character Swinging Rigging tutorial. So in this tutorial we're actually going to run through the whole script, what it can do, how to use it, what the interface is, and how to apply it to your currently rigged characters. So first of all let's just run through these two buttons here in the toolbar. These two buttons here are just settings in your guide, the left one being settings, right one being your guide. In the settings menu, you get to choose if you want to use nulls for controllers, solids for controllers, and you get to choose the size. The maximum size being 200 and the minimum being 10. Anything smaller and they'll just be invisible. So if we just keep this at 100, that's what it'd be set when you first open the script. You then have your guide. Inside your guide, you have some simple information first. You have your character swing rigging version number, who it's made by, you'll then have your licensing information if you wanted to deactivate your license. Within this text box here you'll actually have a small guide about what each button does, how to use it, and what this is actually going to do. Then below this, if you this wasn't enough for you, you can actually run into the full guide. And the full guide is a fully fleshed out document talking about every part of the script, what it does, how it works, and what you can do with that. There's also video guides within this as well to teach you further about the script. They do take a few seconds to load depending on your internet connection. Just be aware of that if you are loading these and it does look a bit funky in the corner. It just takes a while to load because the videos are fairly long. Give it a few minutes or so and they'll pop up in the middle of the screen without any problems. You then have a video guides button here. This will take you to a page where I have a bunch of videos showing what the script can do and how to use the script. So we can get rid of this now. So to show you and demonstrate what all of these buttons do within the script, I'm going to create a simple free squared chain. And this is really simple, it's what I've been using for a while now to demonstrate the script. And we're just going to create three of these objects. And I'm going to change the size of these ones, just so we can get an idea of what's going on. And I can actually just align these quickly, and then I'm going to change the color. And this is what we're going to be using, just so you can see how the actual scripts affecting everything. So I'm going to reorder these, and then I'm going to change the name, put this as object1, object2, and object3. Now we have our objects. Great. So we can start looking at the actual script now. So, with these objects selected here, you can see that the anchor point is presented at a complete random point. And if you wanted to change this, you'd have to grab a layer, press Y, and move the anchor point. And you can center these if you hold the command key or the control key on Windows, and it pins these to points. But it's a very time consuming thing. And with character rigging and this sort of stuff, it's really important where you get these anchor points for how things rotate correctly. So inside the actual character swing rigging panel, you'll actually see on the right side there is nine buttons. And these actually resemble the anchor point of any layer. As you can see, there's nine points around the layer, and these correspond to it. The middle one, of course, being the middle. These two buttons at the top right here are actually a part of the toolbar, but are directly connected to the anchor point itself. So if I just grab the object one for now and then I click the top left anchor point you'll see that the anchor point has jumped all the way over to the top left of the comp and that's because the shape or the mask has not been selected that means if none of these are selected the anchor point is going to be confined to the comps bounding box so in this example it goes to the top middle top right middle right bottom right bottom middle, bottom left, and middle left, and then of course the middle. 
Now if I wanted this to actually go to the shapes bounding box, I would simply click the shape, then select the anchor point, and now this is moving to the anchor point of the shape. Now if I select the mask, and of course this doesn't have a mask at the moment, and try to use the anchor point, it will just tell me that it has no mask, and I need to select a layer with a mask. Now to demonstrate that, if I grab this object, and quickly create a mask on the object itself. Now you'll see with the mask selected, and then if I use the anchor point, it's going to actually create or move the anchor point itself to the mask's bounding box. As you can see, and then if you wanted to switch back to the shape, click the shape, and it will move back to the shape. If you wanted it to the comp, deselect both of them, and then use the comp's bounding box. Now if there's two masks in the shape itself, so if I create another mask here, it's actually going to combine these together, these masks, and create a bounding box around both of them. So if I come into my object one, click the masks, click the top right, the top right is going to be the highest point and the furthest left point. And this is the bounding box at which these masks can contain. You can see it moves around them. The middle point is the exact middle between this bounding box, between all of these points. Of course, back to shape, you can simply go back to the shape. So if I delete the masks, and I don't need them, and this works on multiple objects. So for example, if I select all of the objects and then come over here to the anchor point tool, if I click the top anchor point, it'll move all of them, top left, top right, if I do the comp, it's all going to be moved to the same point. So this works for however many layers you've selected and whatever order the layers you have selected. The next part, we'll be looking at these checkboxes here. Now then, these checkboxes, the top one being a wind controller within the comp. So this will create a layer within the layer stack what holds the effects for the wind, which can control multiple layers instead of just one. And I'll be able to demonstrate that in a bit, bit later. The layer chain is going to chain your selected layers together. So if it's on and then you use one of the buttons down here, it's going to chain these layers together in the order that you selected them. So if I select object 1, object 2 and object 3, after creating the effect, the layer chain is going to chain object 2 to object 1 and object 3 to object 2. So that means object 1 will become my driver. So I normally find it good to leave this on, but there is an option to have it off and that's if, for example, you wanted to tie these to something else, you can tie them to anything you like and the effect will still work. So if I just put the layer chain on for now, and then I'm going to click this button here, what is the create from layers. So what this does is going to apply the effect to layers. This button on here will do the same, but to pins on a layer. So if I come over here, select this, it will run through it, and it will normally leave you on the last layer selected. So just head over back to your driver, will be named driver now and you'll see all the effects in the top left so inside this you'll realize something quite quickly that the layers have now been renamed so the first one will be called driver your first part of the chain that you have connected so this is basically one object now that they're all connected and their flow will move depending on whatever this driver is doing so your second one will now be called chain one. Your third one will be called chain two. If you had more than three, then it will just keep going up for as many as you select. There is no limitation on this. So if you head over to your driver and move it, nothing's gonna happen. There is nothing happening with this whatsoever. And that's because number one, there's no data in the position property for it to do anything. And number two, it's not been enabled.
So what we're going to do is we're going to come in here and we're going to add position keyframe. We're going to come one second along, move the object, and we're going to put an easy ease on these. And you'll see still nothing happening, but it's it's moving, right? So as this is moving, now what we can do is come into here and click Enable Swing. And what this would do is create a swing effect on everything and give it a natural motion swing from one place to the other. And as it gets to the end, it's going to have a natural overflow and come back. And an all important thing here is that this target position here is actually where it's getting its keyframe data from. And the whole script works from keyframe data. So it's very important to make sure whatever you have this selected as has some keyframe data, otherwise it will not swing. For example, if I was to create another quick layer over here, and you'll see that of course this has no data within the position value. If I grab the driver object one, put the target position to shape layer one, now you'll see that of course its movement is still there, but the swing motion has disappeared because this has no positional data on it. If I was to say copy these keyframes and then paste them into this, you'll see that now it has its same swinging motion. If I was then to change this to be say in the middle, what you'll see now is that there's no motion here. As soon as it gets here, it's going to then swing and come back down. And that's because the swing is controlled by whatever this target position is and the data what's connected with this. Switch it back to this, then of course it uses its own data values to control the swing. I'll delete this for now. It's just something was very important to note when using the script to always make sure that there's a keyframe. If there's no keyframe, then of course, nothing's going to happen at all. So, the next thing over here, we have something called Enable Wind. And the wind settings are actually all within this wind global generator. Because we haven't used this button here, the settings will always be with inside the driver of this chain. So everything within this, what well, has a wind enabled, will it be affected by the wind global generator within the driver. It has its base settings at the moment, well it's just a very subtle effect, but if you enable wind, and then I simply get rid of the keyframe because I do not need the second keyframe as I'm not demonstrating the motion it's using, just the wind itself you'll see that there's a subtle wind movement on the layer itself. If there is that second keyframe, then the wind is still taking place, it's just harder to notice because of the movement itself. But the subtle movement of the wind is actually still there and still pushing the object around. As you can see further on, it's still moving. The reverse inside here just simply reverses the whole effect. So as you can see now it's just been put in reverse. One thing to note with this though, the reverse does not reverse the actual wind effect. If you wanted to reverse the wind and which direction, then you'd have to come into the wind setting and change the max power and minimum power to different values. So we're going to be focusing on the wind so we're going to disable reverse and we're going to disable this keyframe here it's just so we can demonstrate what is going on with the effect. So if I come down into wind settings, this is what actually controls what the wind is doing. And the frequency is the speed in which the wind changes direction. Amplitude is how fast it goes from one direction to the other direction and the speed it takes between them. So if your wind is jumping from say over here is A and then over here is B, the frequency is going to change how many times it switches between it and then your amplitude is how fast it moves from A to B. So these numbers, just be careful with them with what you're setting because if you set the speed in which it moves from A to B 
a much higher rate then it changes then what you'll find is that it will look like it freezes it's not actually freezing the speed it moves from A to B is so fast that it gets to B before B changes and stops at its location so if I show you an example of the frequency itself and I'm just going to put these up at quite high values so I'm just going to put 5 and you'll see what happens the actual object is swinging a lot more now and that's because the frequency has been increased to a number of where it's changing from A to B very quickly and it's kind of becoming a more erratic wind if I just play this you'll see how it moves if I then change the amplitude to say 5 it can create a bit of a different effect and as you can see what I said before is that it gets to this point and it somewhat freezes there it gets stuck here and that's because it's got to this point faster than this point has changed direction. So as you can see, this is more erratic, but it's too fast. So being careful with this value is really important to how you want this effect to look. If I reset this back to normal. The max power and the min power. So the max power can both be a positive and a negative, and the min power, of course, can be a negative and a positive. It depends on the direction in which you want things to rotate but if I change this to say minus 20 and 20 what you'll get here is you'll get this just a larger amount of wind the wind is now more powerful than what it was before you can see that there the random seed basically creates its own random seed for the movement so whatever I set this value to it's gonna be its own seed and if you had multiple of these object stacks, these objects like I have here, if you have multiple of these, then you'll be able to actually change the random seed to different values to have the wind take a different effect on them. If you want them all to be the same, then you could set the random seed to the same value. But we'll dive into that a little bit later when we come onto the wind knob. So that's it for wind and how you can control the actual effect of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to quickly add back into our other keyframe so we can jump on with our wing settings, our wing swing settings themselves. So if I disable wind for now, as we don't need it, or reset the values, as I don't need to play with them for a while, and we come down to the swing global settings. So the global settings affect every single object what is tied to the driver. So whatever you change in here is going to change everything unless you select otherwise, which we'll jump over to after this. So the swing settings, these settings here are the movement the swing actually has as it's moving. As you can see, the movement it has right now is fairly decent. It swings, comes to a stop, has a little bit of an overshoot, and comes to a stop. The settings in here are going to change that. So the amp, the amplitude, is basically going to change the amount this moves while it's going from keyframe 1 to keyframe 2. So as you can see the movement is a fair amount, but let's say I wanted to increase this, I could actually set this to 0 0.04 for example, and you'll see that it's now jumped up a lot higher than what it was. However, the overshoot is still very similar to what's going on previously. And that's because the overshoot controls can be found in the frequency decay and overshoot. So the frequency is how fast it moves at the end of the swing. So how fast it swings back and forth. Increasing this number to say a much higher number six, then you'll see that now when the object gets to the end of its swing, it kind of goes a bit insane, but it has this erratic swing effect to the end. Now if I wish to change the decay to a higher number it means it's actually going to stop a lot faster when it gets to the end. So if I play this it stops a lot faster now, it's stopping a few seconds, a few milliseconds after the last keyframe. If I was to change this number to a lower number, let's say just a zero, the actual effect is never going to stop and it will just keep swinging forever might be desirable by some people but 
For me, not so much. Your overshoot is going to affect how far it shoots past its base value. So when it hits the last keyframe, how far it shoots past that will be controlled by the overshoot. So I'm going to change the decay back to the same value it was, keep the amplitude at 0.04, and I'm just going to whack the overshoot up to like 60. As you can see, this pushed the object much higher than it was before. And this is saying well, when it gets to here, it's going to be pushing up. Now it's very important to note that when you're playing with the overshoot and amplitude that you have to get the balance right between them. Like any object that is falling, if at the end of its fall when it stops, if you're making it push a lot harder, it's going to look like it's being pushed by an external force. So in this example you can see that the movement, the swing it currently has is fairly gentle but at the end it's kind of getting pushed further than it should go and that's because of the mix between the amplitude and the overshoot itself. If I was to change this value to say 30 then it would be a lot less. It still has a little bit of a push. I normally find 20 a good value for this but of course this limits the amount it goes over. So just play with these settings here, the amplitude and the overshoot to get that final amount just right to the F, how far you're moving and the speed that you're moving in. The last thing on this swing settings is the movement clamp. And this is something that I'm going to have to demonstrate by making it super extreme. So I'm going to reset everything back to normal. I'm then going to actually make the amplitude 0.2. So at 0.2, you realize that this is getting stuck at 90 degrees. As you'll see, it swings up, gets stuck at 90, stays at 90, and then moves back down. Now then, the problem here, not problem, the actual thing that's happening here is the movement clamp. And this movement clamp is controlling how far this can actually move up both ways, so on the left and the right. So if I was to change these values over here, so if I was to change these values, you'll see that what's happening is, is because of the amplitude in which this is getting pushed up, the clamp stops it at the maximum that I set here. So if I set this value to say 116, this amplitude is still pushing it further than 116 degrees, therefore it still gets stuck. But if I was to find the sweet point in which this is not actually pushing further than, so at the moment it's going all the way up and around, it's almost doing a 360. But if we have a look now, as this clamp is actually further, the object can move all the way around and not be stuck. So as you'll see, it can move all the way around and then it can come right back around. This is basically control with this amp here. So if I was to change this to say 0.15, it's going to go a lot less and then swing back round. So in this example, it looks like this. If you wanted this to say you don't want it to go this far, then of course you'll just control this clamp, move the clamp back round, say, right, I don't want it to move higher than this position. Now, if it swings, it doesn't go any higher than this amount. The higher this, the further it goes around, the less, the less it goes around. At 90, these seems to do a good amount of work, but of course you can move them all the way up to 360. So that is wind settings, a uh, swing setting. Now if we go into the wind settings, you actually get something called weight. And to demonstrate this, I'm going to stop this second keyframe and I'm simply going to apply the wind and I'm going to increase the amount of wind by negative 50 and put it up to 50, increase this to 2. So now we have a fairly strong wind where you're blowing this object around all over the place. And then what I need to do then, if I wanted this to be affected by weight, if I wanted this to say, hang on a minute, this object is a lot tougher to move by wind. And what I can do is come in here and instead of changing the wind settings, 
I can actually just increase the object's weight. And if I put this at a part where it's moving a fair amount, like here, and increase this, you'll see that it's actually slowly coming down and stopping. Now this is basically giving the object a weight amount, saying that the wind is not going to affect it as much. So if I said increase this to 50% and then come back to start and play it, you'll see now that it's getting affected a lot less than what it was. If I was to increase this to say 86%, it's now being hardly affected. If I increase it to 100, of course, it's not going to move at all. It is 100% weighted. Move this back down to zero, and you get the erratic behavior as before. Now, this works really well when you have a lot of these objects together and you use the wind null, then the weight is also tied to that wind null, meaning you can have lots of different objects weighing different amounts all controlled by the same wind setting. So our next thing will be rotation settings. So what I'm going to do is disable the enable wind. We're not going to use a keyframe at the moment, but I might need to use one in a second. And we're going to look at the rotation settings and what these do. So the rotation settings allow you to connect this object to an external rotating object or have its own extra rotation on top of that. It just gives you more customizability of the actual objects themselves and how much is rotating and rotating by what. So if I enable the rotational settings, you're going to see nothing happen. Well, that's because the target rotation is itself. So right now it's at no rotation at all. And its self rotation, of course, is at zero as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a quick layer over here and I'm going to open its rotation come into our driver layer look at the target rotation and change that to the new layer we just made which is the shape layer just look at it over here in the center of the anchor point as well and then as this object rotates you'll see that your actual object is rotating as well and this can go around as many times as you like to create all sorts of effects. You can then tie this to another rotation and the swing will also still work, including this layer's rotation. So let's say, for example, in one second, the object is going to move from A to B. So it's moving A to B. We're going to reset the wind settings. Okay, so now it's moving from A to B. See it's got a swing there. And let's say for example, I don't know, midway through, we're gonna say that the rotation of this to here is gonna go all the way around to here, just as an example. Then what you'll see happen, as this object moves in, it's actually gonna swing all the way around, carry on its swing, and still use the same effect as when it ends. So if I play this to you, it's applying this rotation here to this object. So you can see, comes around, has the same swing, still gets it applied to it, it's still there. If I was to increase this to 360, and make sure that actually goes here, bring that in, then you'll see that the swing ends the same as if it was normal but it's actually gone all the way around and it's being controlled by this and let's say at the end of this motion i wanted it to swing back around on itself then i can actually change this to zero and it's swung all the way around so i can come in here swings back around does its thing and this is just a very clever way of connecting different things together to create a more generic, more realistic swing on the actual objects themselves. In here, if I actually get rid of this, if I just get rid of the keyframes on this, keep the rotation at zero, and I use the self-rotation, it's the same thing, but instead of using another object's 
rotation, it's just going to use this property here to control it in which you can animate it as well. There is one thing to note, however, that when this enable external rotation is selected, if the target rotation is set to itself as the driver object, and then you use the self rotation, it's actually going to be rotating in fours and not 180. So the rotation actually happens a lot earlier. And that's because it's calculating its own self rotation at the same time as adding another rotation on top of that. What means that the rotation in total is actually a lot higher than 360. The rotation is now going to be 360 would actually be 90 degrees instead of being the full 360. So you get this kind of strange movement. However, this can be a desirable effect. Say, for example, if you're making some sort of fish, it could be something what might be quite nice to have in there. And of course, to remove all of this, you just disenable the external rotation and it goes back to normal. So the next effect within this as well, you have something called the child rotation settings. And to demonstrate this, we're actually going to use the en enable external rotation. So I'm just going to quickly again grab and create another square to use the external rotation, tie it to this square. The square is not important, so I'm just going to hide it actually, because we're going to use its own rotation settings in here. I'm going to put the layer actually in the middle so you can see what's going on. And bring it down a little bit and now within the child rotation settings you would have something called rotation clamp now what this is actually doing if I was to increase the rotation you'll see that the child layers of this driver are rotating but as you see they kind of stop at a certain point the main object is still rotating this is rotating oh, 360 degrees but the children layer are actually not rotating over a certain point, a certain value. And that's controlled within this rotation clamp. So if I was to increase this to say 122 degrees, if I grab my rotational clamp, if I bring this down, you'll see that they're actually straightening out, meaning that these children are not going to rotate at all. And if they don't rotate, that means no matter where I go, the child is not rotate, so this will cause like a pendulum effect if that's what you're going for. If I was to say it's back up here and increase this, the actual value is getting increased, so they're rotating a lot more. If I was to put this all the way at a maximum of 90, then you'll see that they rotate a lot more as they swing up and round. And if I was to put it, say, here, decrease this number you'll see them straighten out as they rotate up they can actually go a lot higher and this is all controlled just simply with this rotation of clamp so for a lot of times you might not even need other things but for this it's very easy to get a unique swinging motion for your object so if I get rid of all this I'll leave it back to normal actually reset it, it's all back to normal, I'm done. This also rotation clamp affects this swinging value as it's moving. So even though I'm playing with the rotation, it's just a demonstration of how it's being applied. It works with everything, what is including the wind and everything else. The actual swing, if I was to increase this to say 0.2 and then increase this clamp, you'll see that these are actually rotating a lot more than what they were. So this actually applies to everything and all the settings, including the wind, of what you would do. Reset this back to normal. So that's the global settings for your entire driver. Now, this is where it gets slightly more complex, but not overly too much, I hope. So if I come over to my driver and play it across, you'll see it's moving. Now then, if you wanted your children of this driver to act differently to how the driver's acting you can actually do that by coming over to the swing global child settings and this affects all of the children who are connected to the driver independently of what the driver is doing so if i was to enable these settings currently right now they look exactly the same nothing has changed if i disable it enable it 
nothing's changed. And that's because everything is exactly the same. Now, if I, for example, wanted them to be different, all I have to do is change these settings. A quick example, if I just change this to say five, change the tick decay to zero, and then play this, you'll see what happens as these children layers never stop moving and are moving a lot faster than the driver. So combining these effects, you can actually have the children move a different way to how this driver would move. I'll reset that. I could also tie this to another layer's position data. So if I open up the position and then I do my movement here, um, this is going to be a terrible animation, but it will show you what happens. So as you see right now, it's all moving smoothly, and all of a sudden this shape at the top moves. What we're going to do is then apply this data to that shape up here. And what you'll notice is nothing happens as this moves up. But when this object moves at the top, then bottom layers are then moving and swinging independently of the driver. Meaning that you can make something as if it hits something as it was moving. If you say, for example, an object was here as this was to hit that object, it will move the object itself. Just in this example, it's not made to look like that. So it just looks like this. If we change this back to the driver, same data pattern as everything else, remove that, back to normal, right. The one thing that you will notice in here what is different, the rotation settings. So in here you had the rotations of enable external rotation. Now the difference in here is you don't have that option. The rotation settings or external can only be enabled in the global settings, which would affect everything anyway. If I come into here, in the wind settings, you also have another option under weight, what is the random seed. So the random seed is creating its own seed value for its children instead of its driver. So if I was to demonstrate that quickly and just remove this second keyframe, enable the wind, the wind settings of course are set to a fairly high value. So as you can see, the wind is moving a fair amount. If I was then to say, right, the driver is moving a lot, but I want the children to have more weight to them, I can actually increase this weight. And what you'll see now is even though the driver's moving a lot, the child layer's moving a lot less. It kind of creates a weird effect in this order. What you would probably normally do is actually set the driver to a higher weight and the children to a lower weight to actually have a more, more effect. But it's up to you what you want to do. What you can do though is you can actually have your wind settings have its own seed, so you can set this to say seed free. And what you'll notice is there doing two different things. The random seed here is not free, it's zero, so it has its own value for how it's moving. If you change this, you'll see the actual child layers moving by themselves into their own seed separate from the driver. If you wanted them to move at the same values, then you just, of course, put them at the same seed value. And now they're moving within the same group, they just have a different weight, so they look like they're moving at different times. If I reset this, Change the way back to down to zero. Uh, the rotational clamp is the same as what we've seen before inside the rotational settings, the rotation clamp here. And what this does is basically saying that the child layers can move further than what they can here in the global settings. When this number is higher, they get to rotate more. When they're lower, they get to ro rotate less. So another option you've got in here apart from this is you can actually go into the individual chain links themselves and control them. So we're going to leave wind enabled and we're going to demonstrate wind and how the wind works with these. So if I open up the chain, open up the general settings, swing settings, wind settings and the rotation clamp, you'll see that it's fairly similar to that of the global child settings. The only difference is that you cannot set your own target position data value. So these child settings, when enabled, will use the data from the actual general settings target position value. So if I come over to my chain and enable it, 
I can reverse this, so the actual effect if it had a swing value would be reverse, but we're only looking at wind, so reverse, of course, like I said, doesn't reverse wind, only reverses the swinging motion. If I was to say increase the weight to 100%, this individual layer here is no longer moving, and if you watch it, the bottom two are, or the bottom one is, and the top one is, the driver in the last chain, but the middle chain is actually not moving. So what this allows you to set up would be, say, in this example I'm showing you now, the wind. If I wanted to say that the driver has almost no motion on the wind at all, the first chain is going to have somewhat effect by wind, and then the last chain piece is also going to be enabled. It's going to have a much higher value on wind, now if you were to watch this, you'll see that the driver's not moving that much, but the bottom two layers are moving a lot more. And of course you can set their random seed to anything, so they don't even have to move on the same motion path as the driver. And what this creates is like a wind moving between an object, and the object being tied to something, and how that would actually move on a scene. Of course, if you were to use the swing, and you were having your second keyframe here and you had your data for that you'll see it moving the swing is still being applied the wind is still being applied to the object even while it's moving it's just very very subtle and you'll see it more when it comes slower comes to a standstill but of course you can actually have these individual chain items have their own values here so you could say that you want this to be 0 0.2 max it out and then this middle chain is actually moving all the way out, it has its own swing. If you enable this and reverse it, and then you'll see that it has its own reversed effect now. And there's a multitude of effects that you can apply to each layer to create a real swinging object. So if I disable this, come back to my driver. And let's say you have all of this, you're doing all your stuff, and then you're like, you don't want it anymore. What you can then do, of course, is just select all of your objects that have your effect applied to them. Come over to the delete button, click delete, and what happens is, is they will lose everything they had. So the names will be reverted back to normal, all of your rotations will be zeroed out, all of the effects will be gone, but it will still have its position values but they will no longer be chained together. So the effect that I wanted to show you as well was if I come over here and select my object and now add a wind knot. But before I'm gonna apply this effect, I'm actually gonna duplicate this a few times. So first of all, I'm gonna grab the keyframes, duplicate it, get rid of this. Bring it over here. I'm then going to duplicate these, move them to the top, grab the keyframe data, move them again. So now I have two objects, I don't need the actual movement on these. Two objects right here, I'm actually going to add a third one, just so you can see what happens if I do not apply the effect. Okay, so in this scene I have three of these object groups where I'm going to chain together and add a wind knot. So if I select the first ones, have my wind knot checked, have my chain all selected layers together, and I click my create learn layers, press this button, what you'll get is you'll get a new knot on the scene. And this knot object can be changed to a solid or a knot, it's your choice by using the settings, but for now it's a knot. And this has all of the wind settings for this group here. So as you can see, if I go into the driver, there is no longer any wind settings within the driver itself. It's now using the data from this null. If I was then to grab, say, these, and go grab them all, and do the same thing, it's selected. If I create, it's not going to create a new wind null. 
it already knows that one exists and it's going to use the same data from this winner. That means that my driver object 6 doesn't have any win settings. If I was then to create this one, but say I actually don't want to null, don't want to use the null in the comp, and then create, in the driver itself it's going to have its own wind global generator. So how does this work? So what I'm going to come down to is come to the enable swing, enable wind. Then I'm going to go to object 6, enable swing, enable wind. This object, enable wind, enable swing. So open up the wind settings on this one. Open up the wind settings here. So I'm going to change the max power to minus 50 and the min power to 50. And as you can already basically tell, these objects are being controlled by this wind knot. And this one is using its own effect. So as you can see, if I play this, these are being affected by the wind null, and this one isn't. It has its own wind settings. If I was to say I want this to be super erratic, I could change this to like 4, and then play it, you'll see that this wind is pretty erratic, whereas this is more of a smooth wind. If I wanted them to be the same, of course I could just set the values to the same value, right? Now they're the same. Apart from the erraticness, I better change that as well. So let me just change this back to 0 0.7. Now they're exactly the same, their movement is the same, everything's the same. Well maybe I want to change that. I can actually change the random seed of this one to be different from the other two. And as you see, even though the movement and everything is the same, the seed's different, so it actually moves on a different value. If I come over to the wind now and set this to the same seed value, and again, they move at the same amount. But instead of having to change this all the time, there's a much simpler way to get this to be working with the same values. If I was to say it's minus 10, and it's 10, at the moment it's moving like this, but I want this object here to actually move the same to the wind knot, all you have to do is come over to the wind global generator and delete it. When it's deleted, it automatically knows that there's a wind global generator null in the comp, and it's then going to be able to use that one's data to power itself. This allows you to tie lots of different objects to one amount of wind. And of course you can set the different weights for these. So this one's going to be 83, this one's going to be 42. If I play this now, they have different weights, so they're moving at different values, even though they're connected to the same global generator. And of course, if I don't want all these, I can select everything, press delete, it removes everything, and I'm back to just my standard original layers. And that's the basis of character swing rigging and what it can do. There's one other feature that I want to show you. And if I grab my object and everything inside, put it here, it's going to be pretty large. As you can see, I actually have Duic open on the right here. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to create an arm. And if you haven't used Duic 16 yet, absolutely amazing. You should definitely, definitely use it. And what I've done here is I've just created a simple limb like this. And this is an arm limb. This would be your shoulder, this would be your elbow, this would be your wrist, and this would be your hand tip. And if I grab all of these, come over here, auto rig them, now what I have is I have a little rig stretching, so I'm going to remove the stretch. I'm actually going to remove the guide, so now what you have is you have a simple hand, what well, is moving this all over the place. And I'm going to reverse the IK. There we go. Nice and simple. Now what you can do with this object group, what is pretty amazing, what you can do is you can come over here and you can apply your layer chains and everything that you want, apply the effect, the effect's now been applied. So I 
grab this arrow thing's moving around. You can now actually parent this layer to the controller hand, what is this controller here? So now its data points are coming from this controller. Move it into a position. Actually, no, that was my mistake. What you want to do is actually grab this and put it on the forearm or wherever you want. Actually, I'm going to stick it to the arm here. So this arm will be the arm. Connect this to the arm. Then move this object up into the arm itself. And it's going to be huge. But just let's ignore that for a second. And then in the driver object one, we're going to say the target position is going to be the C hat. Now it's taking all the data from the keyframes were set inside the hand value. So if I position one, and then I'm going to say, it's going to move from over here. You can see what's happening already. That as it moves, this is moving the layer. But what is amazing is that you can tie these effects together. Easy ease. Come into here, enable the swing. And what you'll get is as this moves, you now have a natural swing of this object as the arm is moving. And of course, if I was to move this maybe over here, you're getting this actual gentle swing of clothing. If this was, of course, much smaller and proportionally sized and with actual graphics what made a good effect, then you can see that this can be added and stacked together with lots of different layers to create the effect of clothing. And if you was to enable the switch, the wind, for example, so if I actually just delete everything on there, I don't need it. Make sure that the object is going to be tied back to the arm. Select everything. Do a wind null. Create. Come over to the driver. Enable. Change to C hand. Make sure the motion is there. It's all there, as you can see. And now if I enable the wind, enable the wind, come into here, wind global generator, let's say increase this by 10, just pretty extreme numbers. And what you can see now is that the wind is still moving the object even when it's attached to something else. What means you can have lots of clothing, stack these upon each other at the right size, and then this can act as clothing or hair or fur on any sort of rig and it'll connect to go perfectly. If you wanted to say actually connect this to the forearm then we'll grab this move it into the forearm position make sure that the keyframe doesn't move it around and now it's attached to the forearm and as you can see same thing's happening. The swing's still getting applied and as it moves it's following that rotation and you can attach it to the rig itself. And this can create all sort of amazing effects. So that's it with the character swing rigging tutorial and the capabilities of what it can do and how it can improve your animations. Would love to see what you guys create. So if you can, if you do post anything to Instagram, make sure you tag me so I can come and have a look. If you get any problems with the script at all, just drop me a bell and I'll see what I can do to fix them. Thank you.